In a sermon series now, today is uh, number six of a sermon series I've entitled, How to Move from Languishing to Flourishing. A lot of people don't think they're languishing, but the word languishing really means that you've become dispirited, um, that you've kind of lost your vigor, your vitality. And that happens to a lot of people. It's happened to me from time to time. Um, the word I like to use is like, I get into a funk. You ever been in a funk? Or maybe you're in a funk now, right? Um, and, but, but God doesn't want you to stay there. He wants you to live a life of flourishing. And Jesus said in John 10.10 10, that he came to bring you uh, an abundant life. And that would be the flourishing life. So God wants that for you. It doesn't mean that every day is going to be easy. But he does want you to, to flourish in this life. And so that's what we're looking at. And we're specifically looking at the life of Gideon. And how God used a self-confessed wimp to take an entire nation that was languishing to a place of flourishing. And so the idea is that if God can use a man who said, I'm from the wimpiest tribe, and I'm the wimpiest of that tribe, but God used him to deliver a whole nation. And if he can do that for a whole nation through a wimpy guy, he can, he can change your life through you. And so we're, we're looking at the lessons that we've that we learn, and, and the, the, it's found in Judges 6, uh, chapter 6, 7, and 8. A really interesting story. If you just want to read a quick story that's extremely interesting, read Judges 6, 7, and 8. It, it tells this whole story. Um, today, what we're talking about is, is a major roadblock that a lot of people have when God's trying to move them from languishing to flourishing, right? He's trying to move you into that abundant life, but there's a major roadblock that a, a lot of people have that needs to be removed. And we're going we're gonna to talk about that today. But before we get there, we're going to get a quick recap of what's been happening in the life of Gideon, the nation of Israel. This happened, this was all about maybe 1400 BC before Christ. So about 3,400 years ago, um, the nation of Israel had, had, uh, Moses and Aaron, uh, Joshua, had taken them into the promised land. Well, Moses didn't quite get to go in, but you understand what I'm saying. So they're in the land of milk and honey, and they have have experienced just awesome times of blessing. But through those awesome times of blessing, they got complacent, they got self-satisfied, and they begin to just crowd God out of their life. And before long, they're into full-blown pagan worship. And uh, they're, they're, as a nation, they're, they just went south really quickly. And for seven years, leading up to Judges 6, for seven years, the enemy, the Midianites, had been ransacking the nation of Israel, God's chosen people. Every year, just at harvest time, when the, uh, when the nation of Israel would harvest their crops or be harvesting their crops, the Midianites, a very powerful army, would swoop in and steal all their crops. And for year after year after year, Israel just kind of put up with this. And you can read in Judges 6 that they, they just started kind of hiding out in caves and, and rock cl clefts and just kind of like, they're like the little kid, you know, being bullied out of his lunch money at school. Right, just like, just take it and go away. And that's kind of what was going on in the nation of Israel. They were languishing. And finally, evidently they'd had enough. And so one of the, the first lesson that we looked at as we looked at this sermon series is that the first thing they did is they cried out for help. They finally cried out to God. The one they had been rejecting, not really rejecting, just neglecting would be a better word. And <laughs> God help. And so that was the first thing we learned. And then God came to them and reminded them of his faithfulness to them in the past. And um, you can go back and look at the sermons or on our website, newlifefairfield.com. It explains that whole progression there. But what's interesting, and this is kind of God's MO method of operation, uh, God rarely, I'm not saying never, God rarely swoops in and just takes care of things like in a moment like help I need help okay and he just makes everything just perfect like that all your circumstances your bad circumstances are taken care of 
He almost never operates that way. He almost always, I'm gonna say, I was going to say invites you to participate. It's more like he requires you to participate. He's like, you need, God's saying like, you need me to move, move miraculously in your life. You need that. And I want to do that. I've been waiting for you to ask. Now that you've asked for me to move miraculously in, in your life, I'm going to require your participation. And so I am going to move miraculously, but I want you to take these steps of faith. And as you take these steps of faith, I'm going to meet you there, and you will see amazing things happen in your life. God has been doing that with his people since the history of people. And that's the, still the way he operates today. I mean, there's people that, that need physical healing, and we're going to be praying for that after church today. There's several people that need that today, and we believe God's going to do just amazing miracles. But, but God could just heal people right now. He could. But for whatever reason, he's asked us to step out in faith and for us to speak healing in his name. Okay? So he's, God responds to faith. And, and that faith requires bold steps on our part. And, and we see God working through this wimpy guy, Gideon, to take bold steps of faith as God begins to work miraculously in, in the nation of Israel and moving them from a place of languishing to a place of flourishing. Okay, so that's, that's kind of where we're at. So, so God, it says the angel of the Lord, and I explained this a couple times before, showed up to Gideon while he was threshing grain in the wine press, which is because he was hiding. <laughs> Sometimes in the Bible, when it says the angel of the Lord appeared to someone, it's literally an angel, like the angels that came to the shepherds, the angels that told Mary she was going to have a baby. Um, it was an angel. Most often, it means God himself appears physically. And you can tell whether it's like just an angel or like God himself by the context. God will reveal like, hey, it's, yeah, it's me. Okay, <laughs> well, I think, I thought if you, anybody saw God, they died. I don't want to revisit the whole sermon from last week or two weeks ago, but Jesus was born as a human on this earth about 2,000 years ago, but he has always existed. Jesus Christ has always existed as part of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's, it's, the Bible tells us that Christ was actually, all creation was created through Christ. So he has always, always existed, just he was born in the flesh and became totally human, while at the same time being totally God, 2,000 years ago. Okay, so... When it says God shows up with the angel of the Lord, it's a pre-incarnate manifestation of Christ. It's Christ showing up and talking. Right? So that's what happened. It happened to Abraham. Uh, it happened to Joshua. It happened to Hagar. It happened to a lot of people. also happened to Gideon. So God himself, pre-incarnate Christ, shows up and, and he says, Hey there, mighty warrior. And that's where Gideon goes like, uh, Yeah, wrong guy wimpiest clan, wimpiest guy in the clan. And so he was reminding him, uh, he was revealing his identity that he wanted him to step into. He said, I'm going to use you mightily and we're going we're to defeat the Midianites. And Gideon's like, um, we thought you had abandoned us because like, we've been hurting for a long time and you like been nowhere to be found. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. That was interesting. You might want to take a look at that sermon because God, God really doesn't, he does not abandon you. We abandon him. Anyway, that's another story. So Gideon wants God to prove that it's God. And so he goes and gets a sacrifice, sits it out, and poof, fire comes from heaven and consumes the, fire, the whole sacrifice. And then God is gone. And Gideon's like, wow, that was, that was God. All right. So, so he knows it's God, and he knows he's getting ready to do something. All right, so now we're picking it up to today's story. Judges chapter 6, starting in verse 25. So pre-incarnate Christ is still talking to uh, Gideon. The Holy Spirit is talking to Gideon. 
but he's just not physically there, okay? Just kind of like what happens to us today. The same night the Lord said to him, take the second bowl from your father's herd, the one seven years old. Tear down your father's altar to Baal and cut down the Asherah pole beside it. Uh, Baal was a, a pagan god. Uh, Asherah also was a worship thing. They were, without getting into a lot of detail, they were sexual statues that I don't need to explain right here. Uh, verse 26, then build a proper kind of altar to the Lord your God on the top of its height. Using the wood of the ashray pole that you cut down, offer the second bowl as a burnt offering. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord told him. But because he was afraid of the family and townspeople, he did it at night rather than in the daytime. In the morning, when the people of the town got up, there was Baal's altar demolished with an ashray pole beside it, cut down, and the second bowl sacrificed on the newly built altar. Idolatry was the prevailing sin in Israel at, at that time. And basically what God was saying, I'm paraphrasing, he's like, I'm going to come in and move miraculously amongst you. You're going to see amazing things, but before I move, we're getting rid of this junk. We're getting rid of this idolatry, and I want you to tear it all down. What was amazing, because <laughs> the, whole, the whole nation was steeped in the, by now into this idol worship for whatever reason. Well, I, it was demonic, but anyway. Um, and it was interesting that Gideon's dad was the one that had like, built some of these idols. Gideon's own father. And so he's like, hey, go, go tear down your dad's gods. <laughs> so that, that's kind of why they did it at night. Uh, but God said, we need to get this torn down. And, here, and here's point number one. Here's why. Because idolatry is a major roadblock to God's miraculous power. Remember I said earlier that we're going to talk about the roadblock to God moving in our life to take us from languishing to flourishing. One of the big roadblocks, major roadblock, idolatry. Because idols dull our senses and our spiritual hearing and dulls our hearts um, to, from, from God's love for us. God loves you whether you love him or not. He loves you unconditionally. But when you have an idol in your life, your heart becomes dulled to that knowledge, that revelation. In fact, the Bible even says that uh, from one of the <laughs> well-known prophets who ran away from God, Jonah. In Jonah chapter 2, verse 8, it says, those who cling to worthless idols turn away from God's love for them. A lot of people feel like God has pulled his love from them. It's like God has not pulled his love from you. You've wandered out from, away from his love. And a lot of times it's from adultery, uh, adultery, idolatry. <laughs> well, both, it could be both. But you might be asking, well, isn't idolatry, like, isn't that just old... Old Testament, an Old Testament problem. I mean, I understand where they would make golden statues or carve things or whatever and bow, but we don't do that today. Well, mostly we don't. You're, you're correct. We don't. But here's, here's what an idol really is. Okay, even though we don't bow down in front of a carved statue, this is number two, an idol can be anything that takes the place of God as the most important focus and priority in your life. Now, now we might have some idols, all right? <laughs> Idolatry is not just an old covenant problem. It's a New Testament problem. Idols are addressed in the New Testament, not so much bowing down in front of a statue, but more of a spiritual issue. What, what is, what's crowding God out of your life because again, we're not physically bowing before a statue, but we're really, people are bending their life away from God and, to, and towards something else. And, and we as Christians can, it's easy for us to do that. We'll talk more about that in a minute. A couple weeks ago, just as a refresher for your memory, and some of you weren't here, but we were talking about the word worship. Because you worship an idol. You think, well, I, I don't worship any idols. I worship God. Well, well, let's see. 
The word worship, if you remember, comes from an old English word, two words, worth, W-R-T-H, worth, ship. So that worth is like value or worth. So when you, when you worship God, you're saying you are worth it, God. You are worthy of my praise, and I am proclaiming your value. So when you worship something, you're proclaiming value, right? That's worship. That, that's the kind of the dictionary definition. And it's easy as Christians, well, it's easy for everybody, but even Christians, to start giving more worth and value to other things other than God. Now, we would never say we, we, would never say we do that, but we do. I've done it. So I, I kind of know what I'm talking about. Uh, and I, I see it all the time. And one of the words that we've, we use when we talk about God is our devotion to God, right? Are you devoted to God? Oh, yes, I'm devoted to God. Uh, the word devote in, in the um, dictionary says to give over or direct, as in time, money, or effort, to a cause, enterprise, or activity. All right, so time, money, effort. What are you, where, are you, where are you putting the bulk of your time and your money and your effort towards some cause or enterprise or activity? See, when we start thinking about devotion in that way, it's like, oh, I'm devoted to a, a lot of things. <laughs> or maybe, maybe I'm more devoted to that than I am to God. I mentioned this um, this kind of this idea a couple weeks ago. I'm rewording it a little bit. But idolatry, at least in the, in the life of the Christian, doesn't come into our life because we kick God out. It's we crowd him out. And that, that's what happens. That's how I draw, idolatry sort of sneaks into our life. It's not like, you know what? I am so done with God. I'm rejecting him and kicking him out of my life. I... I I don't really, I don't personally know that of anybody that's ever done that, but I know people have done that and can do that. I think it's really rare. What happens is people get so busy and they start devoting their devotion and their passions and their worship, their worship, their value, their proclaiming goes to so many other things that God just sort of gets crowded out, not kicked out. And, and that's exactly what happened to the nation of Israel. They never really actually re out and out rejected God. They just crowded him out and filled their life up with uh, all this other stuff. So here's point number three. Modern day idols, because that's what we're talking about now, modern day idol idols, not the calves of gold and the Asherah poles. Modern day idols can start out as good or even essential, but they can become a snare. You know what a snare is? It's a trap, right? It's a trap that you don't that animals or the victim kind of walks into, the not knowing it's there. That's the whole idea of how you make a snare is like the animal doesn't know it's there and then they get caught. And, and that's exactly what idolatry is. It's like you wander into it not really knowing it's there. And then pretty soon you're caught. And actually that's not, that's not my original idea. It actually comes out of the Bible. Psalm 106, verse 36, talking about the nation of Israel and their many, many times, as they worshiped their idols, which became a snare to them, trapped them. They didn't, they didn't see what coming what was coming. Again, it's a snare for us even more today in modern day Christianity because we're not bowing down before a carved statue. I mean, if we were bowing down in front of something and, and burning incense and chanting and to some carved god, we're like, that's that's pretty full blown, you know, literal idolatry. But because we don't do that, we don't recognize it because we've kind of wandered into idolatry and we've kind of got caught. Don't even know we're caught. There's a <laughs> okay. If you want to leave now, leave now, because um, here, I might step on some toes, because I've stepped on mine. There are, I'm just going to list a few 
things that can easily become idols for Christians, all right? I'm not talking about non-Christians, all right? They have, they're going to, you're going to worship something, all right? So I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about Christians and our modern day idols, snares. What can snare us in? And I, I'm not talking about all that I've thought of. I just, I just started thinking, okay, what have I been snared into myself in idolatry? And what have I seen as pastor or whatever other people get snared into? And so, like, things just started coming to mind. Like, oh, there's an idol. There's an idol. There's an idol. And so I'm going to share a few of those just for revelation purposes, not shame on you purposes, all right? Because I think some of these we... We might not know their idols. And, he, and here's, the, here's the thing. I think maybe I have seven or eight of these. Um, and you don't have to write them down. There's no list. I'm just, I'm just trying to make you aware of them. I, I purposefully chose things that are good and perhaps even essential that can become idols. All right? All right. So, and these are in no particular order. Are you ready? If, remember, I love you. Here's the, I hope you love me when this is all done. So here's the first one. And it's, it's kind of I've, two or three things. Patriotism, politics, Second Amendment. Okay, let me, disclaimer. I feel like I'm patriotic. I love this country. I think this is the best country on the face of the earth ever been. I I've sincerely believe that. I... I'm interested in politics. This might shock you. I like presidential elections. Yeah. Now you really hate me. But I don't like a lot of what goes on, but I'm interested in politics. I think, is it the Second Amendment? That's the gun ownership one. I hope I got that one right, right? I believe Americans should have the right to bear arms. It's an important amendment. It's important. And there's a reason for it. Okay, we good? Period. I've seen people make idols out of these things. I've seen Christians, well-meaning Christians, just focus, and I don't even, there's got to be a bigger word for, obsess, that would be the word, over patriotism or Second Amendment. I mean, sometimes those are, they seem to be kind of linked. Those are good things, really, and for our Life here, they're essential to us. I, I get that. But you can make them an idol. And it's like, sometimes I just, it's like, if that person would spend one-fourth of the time talking about the kingdom of Christ and working as, towards that as they do on this, you know, right to bear arms or patriotism or whatever, if they would just do that, it, the, the world would change overnight. So they're good things. It's just like that becomes the priority, not the kingdom of Christ. So there's one. Oh, here's another one. This is, I, I, get the, I left this one. This is the hardest one. Second, so kind of soften you up a little bit. Here's, an, here's a, a really good thing that become an idol. Children. children. I've seen children become an idol. Children are awesome. They're a gift from God. I, I love our two children, boys. I loved being a parent. Love, still I do. It was easy. It, was, it wasn't easy. It was, it was hard. <laughs> uh, it was not easy. It was easy to see them, you know, go, go off <laughs> as adults. <laughs> <laughs> and I love the children here. Okay, got that. I've seen parents make children an idol. Like, here's the deal. Children need to know they're loved, and they need to know that you're devoted to them. But if they ever see that your devotion and love to them supersedes your devotion and love to God, you got a problem. And uh, uh, Pastor Joe Pearson, uh, one of my mentors, the founder of New Song Church in Shoto, where I ended up pastoring, he said... Um, don't love your kids so much that nobody else can. 
I don't know if you ever heard him say that, Steffi, but, uh, but I remember him saying that, and, and sometimes that's kind of true. We can, we can raise a whole uh, generation of narcissistic uh, people because everything is about them and their life being awesome and perfect. And uh, maybe for the term helicopter parents, that's what they're trying to do. <laughs> and um, now there's a new term uh, taking over uh, lawnmower parents. Yeah, there used to be helicopter... Helicopter parents is so 2010, <laughs> or maybe 2015. Helicopter parents, you know, you just hover over your kids. Now the new thing is lawnmower parents. Parents just go out and just mow everything down in front of their kids so their kids don't have to, you know, have any trials or tribulations. You just mow everything down and make the path smooth for them. And I, you know, I get that because you want your kids to have a better life than you and you want them not to go through trials and tribulations. I get all that, but at some point, it just like that can tick over to idolatry where you make, where their, your devotion to them is much more stronger than your devotion to God. It's not that you're rejecting God, you just crowded him out with catering to your kids. All right. Whew. Okay. Maybe this was the harder one. Number three, I'm looking at these like, did I really write that down? <laughs> okay. One more and then it gets easier. Sports. I loved, especially in our area, like in Montana, where we don't have like a professional team. It is not the Denver Broncos. Sorry, Russ, but... People either like if they have a, because we're kind of close to Denver, so it's the Broncos, and they're like you know the Broncos, like like a cowboy thing, right? Um, and then there's the Seahawks. You know, true Christians obviously go for the Kansas City Chiefs, but <laughs> See, <laughs> thank you for laughing. Now everybody knows that's a joke, kind of. Um, but because we don't have like pro sports here, like. College gets a big deal, but high school sports easily has become an idol in a lot of people's lives, especially in our rural areas. And I love high school sports. I, I, I played it. I, I see the, the, why it's so beneficial. I think, I think, personally, every high school student should be involved in a sport because it teaches some really good life skills. And again, I love, I've been, been involved. I announced the football games and did some of the basketball. And I, I mean, I, I've been going to the games. I love them, love them. And I like to see the kids do their deal. I also seen <laughs> that state championship is the number one focused, focus. And we've got, we've had lots of state championships. It's amazing. And I, I okay, I am not saying we've had a lot of state championships because every coach or every player has made sports an idol. I am not saying that, uh, but some have. <laughs> and it's like, is it good to want to be good in sports? Yes. Is it good to set a goal to win a state championship? Yes, because if you don't set that goal, it's not gonna happen. Is it good to work hard towards that goal? Yes. As soon as that becomes more important than the kingdom of Christ, you got a problem. And it's a problem. <laughs> okay, I'm just going to say it. As long as we're <laughs> battered and bruised. I've seen parents haul their kids to every sporting event, practice, camp, you name it. And a lot of them on Sundays. And like they're not going to miss it and can't go to Bible camp because they got this camp or they can't go to church because we got this game or we got this tournament. And I get, sometimes we do that. I'm not busting on people. Sometimes that happens. But here's what happens. Then the kid graduates and they go to college and they're like, pastor, I need help. My child doesn't want to go to church in college. They're, they're not going to church. Really? Well, there's a shock right there. Sorry, I don't say that. <laughs> they never went here. 
because you were so busy hauling haul them everywhere else to do everything and so they could you know, be the best at what they're going to be. And then when they don't want to go to church when they get to college, what in the world were you expecting? <sighs> okay. <laughs> Love you guys. <laughs> hey, I've done that with farming and we'll talk about, we're getting there by the way, hold on. <laughs> if you're feeling left out. <laughs> Please hear my heart. These are, remember, these are all good things. But they can, they can, they're a snare, and pretty soon they're all consuming, and your devotion is there and not in the kingdom. So I am not saying don't do these things. I'm not. I'm just saying you gotta keep the kingdom of Christ number one. Okay. Career business. Uh, careers can become an idol. Owning a business can become an idol. And I know business ownership, I've done it, is consuming. And you have to have, be devoted to it. I get that. But, the, but again, they can, they can overtake your devotion to God. And I know that um, it takes a lot of hard work and devotion to be successful in your career and in a business. But when there's no time left for the kingdom, you're, you're out of whack. Right? When there's no time left to serve God, no time left for his kingdom, then there's a problem. Um, the next one I entitled lifestyle because there's certain lifestyles we idolize. And I told you I was going to talk about farming slash ranching. I've talked about this before because for me that was an idol. I didn't realize it, but far, for me farming, when I farmed, the fam that was an idol. If you, would have, if you would have asked me, is farming your idol? Pfft, no, I don't have idols. I'm a Christian. I totally, it totally was an idol. Um, but I put, I put farming and ranching under lifestyle because I'm, I'm not going to say most. A lot of farmers and ranchers aren't ranching because they want that as a business. They're doing it because they want it as a lifestyle. That's where I was. It's like, I didn't, like, no offense to farmers and ranchers. I've been one. If, if you want to be a business person and make money, probably farming and ranching is not the first place to look. But why do people go there? Well, a lot of them were raised there, but we're like, we love that lifestyle. I love the lifestyle of my boys growing up riding on four-wheelers and having the land to do it on and shooting BB guns when they were way too young and, and you know, tearing machinery apart, not being able to put it back together. And I mean, those were good. <laughs> now I look back, those were good years. <laughs> you know, so there's a, and I know you don't have to have a farm to do that, but, but I get the lifestyle that's like, man, such a, I want that lifestyle, but I've seen, now that I've been able to get out of it and look back, I like, for most people, that lifestyle is more of a, more of a dream. It's more aspirational than it is actual. And that's why there's so much, so much addictions in farming and ranching because it, it falls short, and we'll talk more about that later, of that of satisfying, it's like if I can just enjoy my farm or ranch, I can really live a, a satisfied life. It's like, mm, if that's, if, maybe not. <laughs> Again, can you own a farm or ranch? Yes. It's essential because I like to eat. Thank you, ranchers and farmers. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Keep doing it, but just don't make it an idol. Uh, recreation. I almost put that with sports, but no, in our, in our area, it's kind of a separate thing. It's like because we're turning into, we're turning into a nation that feels like of all work and all play. <laughs> except through coronavirus. That was kind of cool in, in, a, in a way. Because of like, you know, like <laughs> Jennifer's eyes go, what are you talking about? You're flipping crazy. <laughs> it's because we toned down the work a little bit. Some people did. And we couldn't go play. And so we, like, we had to relate. We had, like, had to be, fa we had to have, like, be family and stuff. So that's what I meant by that. Okay. But we, we, recreation can become an idol slash hunting, and do I, I, I appreciate hunters, and I, 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 I'm, I rejoice with them when they get 
they're monster bull elk. And my, my youngest son is an avid hunter fisherman. Um, I don't, he's not made that an idol. If, he, if I felt like he did, I, we would be speaking lovingly, but I don't feel like he's done that. Um, but I, I, I know that that can quickly turn that way. I love, I love where we live. I, it's, it's just, this is an amazing place to live, and recreation um, is so abundant, the opportunities. But again, it can become almost, it can become an idol. Um, well, here's one in case, there might be a few people left out. And this one, this is one I have to battle against. You ready? Religious activity. Religious activity devoid of worship of Christ. I'm not saying not devoid. Um, I'm going to back up. Religious activity, like doing something that has a religious sort of covering over it without the, the thought of building the kingdom or serving God, more of like serving yourself or trying to make a name for yourself, that can become an idol. There are people in churches that live to serve in a certain capacity in a church because that's their significance and that becomes an idol. Okay, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but that happens. Uh, church itself could become an idol if, if, if you don't understand why we're doing church. Okay, we'll move on. Last one. Here's a big one. An idol, self. <laughs> you can make yourself an idol. Like, okay, you are important. You are. And to God, you're the most important. And you, you are special. And you are God's favorite. True, I'm not being facetious. You are. Because God is infinite. Then that means because he's infinite, we can all be his favorite. I know, we are, I know I'm his favorite. I know that. But I also know that you are too. And he can do that because he's infinite. So I get that. But we, what, what makes... What makes our self an idol is when we have this quest for approval and significance. Um, and, and social media has played right into this. There are some people who have made likes on Facebook an idol. Like that's what they live for. And like if they don't get enough likes on Facebook, they're devastated when they post something. Or if they get some likes on something, oh, life is high. Facebook. I, I mean, I'll put something like God puts on my heart and I'll put it on Facebook, you know, and three people give me a thumbs up. I put something stupid about a woodpecker pecking a hole in my <laughs> thing up there, like 162 likes, right? People are commenting on it. Like, <laughs> did kind of puff me up a little bit, though. <laughs> Okay, these can be good things, right? But when they become idols, they become worthless. Let me, let me explain this to you, okay? Hang with me. Number four, idols are worthless because they are powerless to bring you what you're really looking for. Is our children good? They're amazing. They're the best. When they become an idol, as an idol, they're worth, They're worthless. Am I saying your child is worthless? No. I'm saying as an idol, that idol is worthless. I'm going to explain this here briefly. There's four things that, that I feel like God revealed to me. Just, well, he revealed it to me because I've observed it, I've observed it in life over the last however many years. Four things that people are really looking for. They happen to all start with S. So I don't know if I'd made that up or God did. But the first one is security. We're looking for security. Like who will protect me? Who provide for me? Who can I trust? And so, like the Second Amendment, I get that people, I'm, no, I'm trusting in my guns. You come for me, I'm, I'm living and you're not because I got my guns. Now, am I saying guns are bad? No. Can they be bad? Yes, they can be. When they're idle, they're worthless. Significance. It's like, who am I? Do I matter to anybody? 
like, do I have a purpose in life? Am I, am I important? And idols, we, we look to idols to, to fulfill that sense of significance. Whether it could be sports. Hey, we won a state championship, which is great. And I, I, got, the coat, I got the jacket, by the way. Uh, and we get the caps. I'm, I'm fully participating in that. Just not going to make it an idol, right? But if that becomes like your main sense of significance outside of Christ, you've missed it. Satisfaction. We want to be satisfied, right? And we, we sort of have our human nature is kind of a discontent nature, but we want to be content. We want to be satisfied. So it's like, what will bring me peace? What will bring me joy? What will bring me hope? And, and we look at so many things. We look at what, like children, they're going to bring me peace. They're going, to bring, they're going to bring me joy. My kids are going to bring me so much joy. Do kids bring joy? Yes, they do. If that becomes an idol, apart from God, they're not going to bring you joy. Eventually. I mean, it's just not going, to, it's not going to fulfill your satisfaction like you thought it would. I thought you kids would make me happy. <laughs> <laughs> no one would say that, but... And then, the, so those are those first three, um, security, significance, and satisfaction, those are kind of like human things. But there's one more thing uh, that we want that no idol can give, and that's the supernatural. You might use the word transcendence. We want to know that there's something, that we're part of something bigger. We want to know that. We want to, in fact, you know, I've, I've not gone through AA, but I understand, like in the 12-step process, one of the things you do is you have to um, profess your belief in a higher power, right? Now, it gets kind of stupid when they say, and the higher power can be that doorknob. Like, now you've just made an idol, but whatever. But we, we have this sense, like we're wired for transcendence. You know what I mean by tra- transcendence? To rise above, like the supernatural. We're like... We know that this isn't it. I mean, inherently, like in our gut. I mean, we get, we get bogged down by the natural and our eyes get focused on the natural and we get snared by the idols of the natural, but there's something in us. There's something in us like, I think there's more out there. And idols will never, ever, ever, ever satisfy that. Only one person will, Jesus Christ. And when, you, and when you get that one, it's like, whoa. It's, it's one reason why Wicca grew so much in the 90s. Because the church, I mean, the, the Christian church, who had all these to offer, especially the supernatural, didn't walk in that, didn't, whatever, didn't make it clear, like, hey, if you want that, here it is. And, and the world did not see that. And Wicca said, hey, come over to the dark side. You want to see some cool stuff? You want to transcend? You want to see things like crazy things? Come over here, we'll show you. And people by the droves, especially in the 90s, went to Wicca. Still there, a lot of them. It's still growing. Why? Because we're wired for the supernatural. And when we don't experience it, we feel like we're missing out. And we are. God's the only one that can fulfill all four of these things in your life like permanently, right? He's the only one that can do it. And when you let something good or even essential become an idol, it it becomes worthless because it's not going to give you what you ultimately want it to give, which is security, significance, satisfaction, or the supernatural. Again, just to be clear, I'm not calling your children worthless or your sports accomplishments or your seven-point bull elk or your 20-inch walleye. How, much, how big was that thing? It was a monster. Was it 20 inches? You can say it. Your, your walleye, Jeremy, did, didn't you get a 20-inch walleye? 30. 30. Not bragging. I know that fishing is not uh, uh, an idol for Jeremy. So I can rejoice when he catches a 30-inch walleye, and when he has that thing mounted, 
on his wall, I'm going to go over and go, <laughs> you're the man. <laughs> do, you, do, you, are you get, do you see how we can, we can enjoy the cool things from God? We can enjoy 30-inch walleye. We can enjoy state championships and sports and children and, and farming. We can enjoy all that and we can love it. And, but it, do you see how easily they can become idols? Because all of a sudden it, it's like what you're devoted to. And it crowds out the kingdom of Christ and your worship to God. Because you're saying, what well, you're really saying with your time and your money and your effort is like, that's worth more than the kingdom of God's worth. Because that's where I'm putting all my time, effort, and money. So, Gideon's dad, remember I told you he was the one that, Joash is his name, built all the idols. And so in the morning, when they, Israel wakes up and their idols are all trashed, and not only, and it was interesting that God said, he didn't say, oh, and go make my altar, you know, right next to him. He's like, no, put it right on top. I mean, we're not, I'm not crowding in beside this. I'm going over the top of it. That's kind of interesting. So they get up in the morning, they see the altar has been trashed, the altar of God's there on the top. And you'd think Gideon, and, and, and so and you think Gideon's dad would really be mad. Maybe he was, I don't know. But the people said, Joash, we need to kill your son. He like ruined our gods. And we, we need to string him up. Here's what his dad said. Judges 6, verse 31. Because his, his dad's already thinking, hmm. Are those gods really real or not? I think I might have just made those up now that I think about it. But Joash replied to the hostile crowd around him, Are you going to plead Baal's cause? Are you trying to save him? Whoever fights for him shall be put to death by morning. If Baal really is a god, he can defend himself when someone breaks down his altar. Jo Joash is like, If Baal is really God, he'll take care of it. Don't kill my son. So he's already, he's already starting to think, you know, these gods we constructed really aren't, they're, they're kind of worthless because they're not powerful to do anything. Because he knew his son wasn't going to get killed. He knew Baal wasn't going to come kill his son because Baal has no power to do that. So here's a question for you this morning. If you haven't got the question already, has idolatry snared you? It has snared me, so I, I get that. I mean, when I talked about the, 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 the idolatry of farming, I was totally there. I was like, God, I mean, I would never would have said this, and I didn't even know it consciously, but it's like, God, I give you my time. We tithed. We, we, we came to church almost every Sunday, make sure our kids were there. And, you know, we were doing things on the worship team. And if you would ask me, is God number one in your life? Well, absolutely. Can't you tell by looking? It's like, now if I look, if I look really where I was putting most of my time, money, effort, my thinking, my devotion, it was farming. If I had, I tried to carve out a little room for church, which actually could become its own little idol. <laughs> worship team can become an idol. What's the saying? But has idolatry snared you? I'm not, I'm not doing that to point a finger, to bring guilt, shame, condemnation. It's like, I'm trying to bring hope in your life because God wants to move powerfully, powerfully in your life. I know that because he said it. Jesus said, I came, I'm, I've come to give you an abundant life. I've come that you can flourish. I don't want you to languish. I want you to flourish, but you're going to have to work with me here. And the first thing we're going to have to do after I build your faith and you've cried out to me and trust me, that now that we're together on the same page, now we're going to have to tear down some idols. And until you get those idols tore down, we're not moving because they're going to, they're going to get in the way. You're not going to be able to hear me. You're not going to trust me. You're not going to, you're not going to be operating in my love. And this is not going to work. We've got to get those tore down. And I know, I know your heart. I know that you want God to move in your life. I know you know that, and I know that, and he knows that. So what do you got to do? Make sure that all the idols are tore down. Am I saying that you have an idol in your life? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that a lot of people do, and I have. And you might. That's what I'm saying. 
So my question is, has idolatry, idolatry snared you? And here's a question you should ask. Uh, if it did, and it's my children, how do I tear that down? Right? That should be a question you should be asking. <laughs> or if it's my career, how do I tear down the, the, the idol? How do I tear down my career? Like, I need to live? Like, groceries are good? Or what if my idol is myself? Do I tear down myself? No. I mean, you tear down the idol. But here's number five. Make sure your devotion to God supersedes your devotion to anything else. Do you need to be devoted to your kids? <laughs> you better be. If not, I got a couple ladies in the house here that can um, probably be knocking on your door. You should be devoted to your kids. Can you, should you be devoted to your career? Yeah. And your business? Yeah. If you have a farm and ranch, should you be devoted to that? Yeah. But if that devotion supersedes your devotion to God, you got a problem. And God wants, wants to change that. I want to leave you with a, f- a few verses. I'm, just, I'm not going to pontificate on them. I'm just going to read them so you have them for reference. As we, as we close this morning, here's Romans 12.1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Worth it. Worthship. Value of God. We talked about this two weeks ago, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time. We use the same exact verse. In some ways, it's easier to offer a dead animal to God than walk away. You've done your duty. As new covenant believers, we're asked to lay down our life as a living sacrifice. It means you, you keep living. You offer your life as a sacrifice to God. Does that mean you can't do anything fun? No, it does not mean that. But it, it means that there are some, there are, sometimes you need to make some sacrifices. But they're worth it. Jesus said this in Matthew 6.33. Jesus said this. He said to you, seek first. Well, see, let me read it right now. I'm reading the King James Version. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he'll give you everything you need. You need. Are you seeking the kingdom of God above everything else? It's a simple question to ask. It's a good, good thing to think about. Is, is that my first and foremost focus above my kids, above my job, above my farm, above sports, above recreation, all that stuff. Am I seeking the building of the kingdom of God? Am I seeking that? Is that my main deal? And there's a lot of things we can do. It's like, well, how do we, how do we do, like, how do we do all that? And I I just love what 1 Corinthians 10 31 says. This is a verse we're going to end up with today. Paul says, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Like when you go to, to work, do it for the glory of God. It doesn't mean you have to be like spewing a bunch of Christian cliches. It doesn't mean that. It means you love people. It means you work hard. It means you're a person of integrity. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Well, as I said earlier, God's getting ready to move in your life. That's what this whole sermon series is about because I know, I just know from living that from time to time we all, we all get into places of languishing. We all get into a funk. And we don't want to stay there, so how do you move? All right, well, this is what this whole sermon series has been about. And today is about, okay, we're getting ready for a move. We're almost getting ready to see in the next few weeks we're going to be getting into God's miraculous power as he shows up and just does supernatural, crazy, cool things. He's getting ready to do that in your life. He wants to do that in your life. But first, we've got to clear out the idols. Are you willing to do that today? Let the Holy Spirit show that to you. Let me, let me just pray that for you. In fact, why don't you just stand up if you're physically able. And I just want to pray that. Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus, would you show each and every one of us anywhere that we've made an idol. Lord, you have given us so many good things. You have blessed us in so many ways. You've blessed us with with family and friends and recreation and good sports teams and good coaches and good kids and 
seven-point bull elk and 30-inch walleye. Lord, you've blessed us with so many things. But Lord, if there are anywhere that those have become an idol, would you reveal that to us now so that we can put you in your proper place where your kingdom is number one and you are number one and you are the, the focus of our worship and our value and everything falls into place underneath that. Reveal that to us now, Holy Spirit, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.